Good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think it's time to start. Welcome uh, uh, for uh, you all in the name of the Young Academy of Europe. Uh, my name is uh, Sylvester Bonnet. I'm from Leiden University in the Netherlands. Um, so before uh, we go into the symposium, uh, I wanted to uh, very shortly uh, present uh, the YAE and uh, today's uh, symposium. So the Young Academy of Europe uh, is a pan-European uh, bottom-up organization of young European researchers in all academic fields, uh, from the physical sciences and engineering to life sciences or social sciences and humanities. So our, our primary mission is uh, to promote scientific networking and multidisciplinary science, uh, but also to do scientific communication to the general public uh, and uh, to act on science policy at the European level. Uh, we provide input and advice uh, from a younger generation perspective, uh, so uh, our members can become members up to 12 years uh, after PhD. And uh, to finish these few words on the way AE, so I should mention that it was born in September 2011, so nine years ago in Paris, very informally at the time. It was followed by uh, a creational uh, meeting in uh, December 2012, and since last year, we are established uh, established as a charity. Uh, so uh, and we even have uh, someone to help us for our administration. Uh, we are a board member uh, of uh, uh, around 10 members, I think, um, in all fields which are named before. Uh, so today's meeting is related to our mission on scientific communication, also on the networking. Uh, we are all uh, locked down uh, as European researchers uh, at home, which makes uh, impossible for us to join any scientific meetings physically, uh, at least until the end of the summer in, in many countries. Uh, so one month ago, during one of our board meetings, uh, the idea came uh, to organize an online conference about the science of uh, COVID-19 virus. Uh, we are all fed with a lot of information in the media, uh, a lot of pseudo-scientific news uh, about the virus uh, online. And uh, they all have highlighted that uh, the role played by scientists uh, has changed uh, in many European countries, and in particular in the European COVID-19 societies, um, in their role in advising the governments. Uh, so the scientists have taken a prominent role, in particular the epidemiologists, which have never been so much visible uh, as in the last three months. So we have decided to dedicate this first YA online symposium to the COVID-19 epidemiology. And we found three speakers who are all members of our organization to present uh, to you uh, three perspectives, three different perspectives on this topic. Uh, the first one will be done by Helen Stagg, uh, who has a doctorate in medicine. Uh, the second uh, presentation will be done by Judge Rust, uh, who has a doctorate in mathematics. And the third uh, one is from Marco Paggi, or Paggi, I'm not sure, uh, who made his uh, PhD thesis on structural engineering. And we will finish uh, these three, uh, well, half an hour sessions with a, a, a fourth half an hour session for uh, question and answers. Uh, so we hope to be done around six o'clock. Uh, we would like uh, to, well, I would like to highlight that it's the first online meeting uh, we are organizing. Uh, we would love to organize more if this, is, if this one is a success. And if you are interested um, either in sending proposition of topics uh, for contributions or general topics for symposia, uh, please send it to us, uh, to the board, uh, by email. Um, I think most people have, have muted their, their microphones. Uh, before I, I leave the word to the, the first speaker, I would like to thank uh, the technical platform which we are using today. Uh, so this is an open source uh, pl platform, uh, Indigo, uh, big blue button, and an exascale server. It's been funded by the uh, uh, European Open Science Cloud, so by the European uh, Union. Um, and we are very happy that uh, this all seems to work today. So this being said, I will uh, shortly introduce our first speaker, Ellen Stagg. As I said, she has a doctor of medicine from the University of Cambridge. Uh, she's uh, uh, also in the UK uh, right now. And um, yeah, what, sh what, shall I <laughs> what shall I say? Uh, she has a lot of, uh, um, well, she's quite impressive, I would say. Uh, she's a member of the way since uh, uh, some, some time. 
She's a member of the World Health Organization. Um, she has done a lot of research on European uh, tuberculosis. Uh, oh, sorry, on tuberculosis, and uh, yeah, she's a, she's a, I think quite prominent uh, uh, person in the field. So I won't spend uh, too much time, and maybe I will give the floor to her directly. Uh, switch off my microphone and the camera, and Helen, the floor is yours. Um, so thank you very much, Silvestra, for that uh, kind introduction and for the invitation to present today. So I'm delighted to be here presenting um, and basically celebrating a huge number of my colleagues who are infectious disease epidemiologists, uh, rightly, as Sylvester says, becoming more famous at the moment and indeed, I believe, becoming rock stars. So thank you for the opportunity. So by now, you'll probably be reasonably familiar with the timeline of events that's brought us to the current position, but I thought it would be helpful just to summarise kind of what's gone before us um, before we delve into the details of what we need to know. So on the 1st of December 2019, the first patient we know of um, who was later diagnosed with COVID-19 developed symptoms in Wuhan in China, and we only found out this retrospectively. Um, but this was the first known uh, index case of the condition. And then on the 10th of December 2019, the first patient who was linked to the Hunan seafood wholesale market in Wuhan developed symptoms. And probably you've heard a bunch of information about um, this market within Wuhan in terms of speculation as it's a wet market about whether or not this is the source of infection. But it's kind of interesting to note that that uh, patient was actually developed their symptoms nine days after the previous patient who was not known to be linked into this wet market. On the 31st of December, so a mere three weeks after that um, second patient's symptoms were, were developing, China reported a cluster of patients associated with pneumonia and centered around Wuhan, which will later be known as the first proper cluster of patients associated with this pandemic. And then um, less than two weeks after that, the genetic sequence of the virus was publicly shared. So this is pretty fast scientific process, progress in the field that we got um, from the state of a cluster of cases being notified to a genetic sequence and a known um, causal pathogen really, really quickly. On the 20th of January 2020, the WHO, the World Health Organization, announced that there was evidence of human to human transmission. And obviously, there's a massive difference between um, a small number of cases of infection of a novel virus where we think potentially they're all coming from a source in the environment or an animal source versus known transmission from human to humans in terms of how much um, a novel pathogen could start taking off around the world. And this is where people started to get quite nervous. On the 30th of January, in light of the previous news, the World Health Organization announced um, a PHEC, which is basically a public health emergency of international concern. And that was because of the human to human transmission and the number of cases that we were starting to see internationally. On the 22nd of February, so only three weeks or so after that announcement by the World Health Organization, um, the first lockdowns in Europe started to occur. So this was towns in northern Italy that have been particularly badly hit in terms of the numbers of cases that they were seeing. Um, and then a very short amount of time after that, Italy went into national lockdown. And I believe that was the first um, national lockdown in Europe that we actually saw in response to the virus. And only two days after that, following quite a bit of pressure, the World Health Organization declared a pandemic and they said that they declared that on the basis of the, um, the spread of the virus around the world, the number of cases and what they felt was insufficient action by a whole number of governments around the globe in terms of how quickly they were responding to the severity um, of the pandemic to date. So that's just a summary of sort of the key news events, as it were, surrounding the pandemic. And I know we all, we've all lived through it and we know how fast it felt, but reading it on paper, it seems all the quicker how, um, how things kind of turned around. So just thinking about um, data on patients suffering from COVID-19 proven cases around the world, and these were mostly cases that were hospitalised, and looking at the spread of the virus from country to country, I thought I'd show you some, um, some mapping data that some people have uh, very kindly pulled together. 
And this uh, basically plots the number of severe cases with confirmed disease country by country. And the, the darkness of the shade of red shows how many cases a country has. So when it gets nearly black, then that's over a thousand cases. So as you can see on the 12th of January, um, then China had 41 reported cases of COVID-19 that have been proven. And then you start to see spread um, of reported cases moving throughout Southeast Asia uh, as time progresses and China's cases ramping up quite substantially. Ooh, I apologize, these um, mapping slides are a little bit large to load and thus low. Um, here you see the first case being reported in South Korea and obviously South Korea was quite famous in terms of the fact that they had a cluster of cases associated with a particular religious organization, which resulted in quite um, a strong public health response to deal with that. Now we've started to see uh, cases being reported in North America, and then um, in a not too distant period of time, so before the end of January, we start to see the first in Europe, so initially reports in France. And obviously, again, these are severe cases that are being reported um, in terms of uh, people having mild disease and therefore not being tested or asymptomatic disease, then those might go undetected for a while. So we're going over a thousand cases in China into several thousands at the moment um, as we progress through January. And you can really start to see the virus picking up um, on many different continents. So Australasia has got a number of cases now as well. Um, and you can see China going darker and darker in terms of the number of cases it's reporting. So it's about to go over 10,000 um, as we go to the end of January. Uh, and more and more spread throughout Europe. So we're starting now to see cases really taking off in Italy, which we know is going to become one of the epicenters of infection within um, the European Union. But just more and more spread as we go. Uh, and I will ask Silvestra to change my slides in just a second so we can um, move on to the next presentation. But yeah, cases now in Canada, uh, a small amount in South America. If you can just change over the slides, please. I think Thomas is supposed to do it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, if I can just have presenter mode back, yeah. Okay, so as we progress through February, um, then you can see um, sort of parts of Southern Asia really starting to show up with cases and indeed our first in North Africa. And obviously later in March, there is a increasing concern about what happens in South Africa and South Africa itself going into lockdown. But you can really see um, Italy increasing in terms of the number of cases that it's showing and going a darker and darker shade of red as time is progressing in February. So it feels as though events um, took off more quickly around the world than I have been able to flick through these slides, but that's a month and a half moving from a handful of cases in China to nearly 80,000 in China by the end of February, um, and reports and huge numbers of continents, including within Africa, where we haven't seen so many cases taking off Australasia, different parts of Europe and Asia, as well as the Americas. So, I mean, this is really demonstrating the impact of a very interconnected world that the virus managed to spread quite so quickly. Um, so hopefully in the not too distant past, you all remember going to a party. And I know that that seems like a very distant memory right now. But uh, for all epidemiologists, when a stranger asks you at a party, what do you do? And you say epidemiology, you often get a very confused reaction back. And then perhaps somebody might ask if you work on conditions associated with skin. So the epidermis. And that was definitely the situation up until the start of 2020. Um, but at the, in March this year, I'd say the situation had drastically changed. And a lot of people now have heard of epidemiologists and what they do. And I credit the New York Times partly with this by saying epidemiologists are the new rock stars, which is definitely a compliment that um, anyone in any career, I think, is very willing to accept. So 
what is the role of epidemiology in all this? You've probably heard of the name now, but not necessarily kind of what we're contributing to the um, to the effort to control COVID-19 and the pandemic. And in order to explain that, I wanted to go back briefly and just look at uh, Zika virus, which really hit the news in 2015. And that was the association potentially between Zika and microcephaly. So in the UK, there were some pretty ridiculous news headlines surrounding Zika at that point. Um, in our tabloid newspapers, kind of shock horror about how Zika could um, could really impact the population around the world and, um, and the terrible uh, judgments that it was making in terms of what was happening to different people in different countries. So very, very judgmental language. But more importantly, from, from my perspective, there's sort of how we reach the conclusion of how Zika virus actually was causing problems with microcephaly in newborn babies. And at the time, so in early 2016, I was actually at a hen do, so prior to a friend's wedding, and somebody else there was debating whether or not um, to go on holiday to South America and was quite concerned about Zika virus. And another friend of mine turned to me and basically said, you're an epidemiologist. Why hasn't anybody been able to prove the association between Zika and microcephaly within weeks? You know, why are you taking months to figure out exactly what's happening? So I couldn't actually answer her very well at the time, and I regretted that. But later I went uh, um, back and did a bit more research. And our key questions in terms of not being able to prove the association were basically the fact that we couldn't define our exposure very well. So at that point, we didn't have a good test for the Zika virus and particularly past exposure to infection. So we had no good blood test for it at all. Um, we also didn't have a good definition of our outcome. So microcephaly is normally um, ascertained by looking at a child's um, head circumference. And that can vary between populations and between ethnicities. So because of that variability, there just was no internationally agreed definition of what microcephaly um, was that could be used from country to country in order to measure which kids were affected. And then additionally, we didn't have data on, um, on the exposures. So we didn't know for a lot of countries, birth registries for every single infant and also the number of pregnant women in each country. So that was really affecting our estimation of the women who had been exposed in the right trimester of pregnancy. So all that basically led to a lot of uncertainty, um, but eventually some data came along that basically showed that if you had been exposed in an early trimester of pregnancy to Zika virus, then your odds of your child having microcephaly were increased more than 70 times. So it was a really, really strong association once those data came through and we had the outcome and the exposure defined properly. So do we have similar problems with COVID-19 as those that we had with Zika? Um, you could say that COVID-19 is an easier thing to deal with because we're not dealing with a vector-borne condition. So we've got no mosquitoes in play. It's all about the transmission from one human to another. And I would argue that many of the problems that we had with Zika do still come into play for COVID-19. The first one of those is the case definition. So how do we know how many people to count who have actually had infection and disease? Um, so obviously, because the viral sequence was released very quickly, then developing a test for who actually had disease um, was also quite a quick process in terms of using um, polymerase um, chain reactions, so RT-PCR, in order to test for the virus. But as the number of cases increases, and particularly in resource limited settings, then you might not be able to test everyone. And you might not have people um, ending up in hospital, which is where the preliminary testing was done. So sometimes you need other mechanisms of defining cases in order to avoid having to um, uh, problems with having to virologically test everybody. And for surveillance purposes, symptom tracker apps such as this one from King's College London that's been rolled out across the UK are really, really helpful because they give you an indication of, um, of less severe cases of disease that are happening in a particular country. Now, the symptom tracker app at the moment is largely using fever and persistent dry cough in order to indicate who has symptoms in the UK. But obviously that's being refined all the time so that we make sure we've got an accurate case definition for surveillance purposes. Um, one of the really, really big questions is what the role of asymptomatic infections is. 
and how many of them indeed there are. So there were early studies on sort of more captive populations, people stuck in cruise ships around the world um, where there had been a COVID-19 case or more than one, and examinations of transmission and in that um, in that cruise ship population. So looking at um, when people were exposed to the infection, if you then tested them with the virological test, did you find that a bunch of people had actually developed the infection but weren't displaying particularly severe symptoms or were completely asymptomatic? And that led to suggestions that about 50 to 80 percent of people who pick up the infection are actually completely asymptomatic or have very, very mild forms of the disease. And obviously, this causes huge problems for um, for control of spread because you can't contact trace people where you don't know that they've even got the disease at all. Um, and it means that individuals are wandering around and um, potentially spreading infection without even being aware of it. So asking people to self-quarantine also becomes much more difficult. And that's why we've seen the lockdowns that we have, where um, we're encouraging people to stay at home in order to avoid that period, perhaps even before they develop symptoms of transmitting the infection, let alone the people who will never develop symptoms at all. Another question is, who is most at risk? So... Um, I'm sure you'll have seen media reports suggesting that men are suffering more from coronavirus than women around the world. Um, definitely the older age groups are, and also that certain ethnic groupings are suffering more too. Obviously, each of these associations need to be pulled apart in a little bit more detail as the research moves on. So what is the influence of socioeconomic status in these um, suggested associations? How much of it is actually genetic and how much of it is due to other factors? whether smoking is coming into play and all this sort of thing. But the the choosing of sort of particularly vulnerable groups for severe disease and mortality is what's led to the shielding recommendations that certain countries have released, saying if you fall into a particular vulnerable population group, um, say if you're a cancer patient undergoing chemotherapy, then you really, really do need to limit how much time you spend outside and preferably get your food delivered to you. And then there's the big question about whether seasonality is going to come into play. So as we move into summer in the European nations, will we see less disease? Now, previous data on influenza and pneumonia and the common cold shows distinct seasonality. So this is some data from America on pneumonia and influenza. And you can see that um, each summer, basically, there's a dip in the number of deaths due to those particular infections. But we don't know for COVID-19 if this is going to come into play. Um, all we can really do is look to other countries which have conditions, weather conditions, climatic conditions, similar to those that we, we would normally see in Europe in summer um, and say, are they seeing less transmission and could seasonality be a reason for that? The big concern if seasonality does come into play is whether we'll see a huge surge next winter and what's that's going, what that is going to do to our healthcare services. Um, a further question is the role of children in transmission. So many countries have shut down schools um, in order to prevent transmission. And that's partly linked to data, say for influenza in particular, where we know children are big vectors of transmission within families and, um, and indeed between generations. But for COVID-19, we really don't know quite what's going to happen along those lines, because obviously we've seen very few children suffering from severe disease at all. Um, and whether that means that they're picking up the infection or not picking up the infection is a key question. And whether even if they pick it up, they're actually able to transmit it on to other family members or how well they transmit is another key question. The sort of million dollar question I would say right now is whether immunity against um, the SARS coronavirus 2 is actually possible and how long it might last for. So obviously this goes back to the vaccination question and whether we'll be able to roll out a vaccine um, long term in order to quell the pandemic. And that'll be our final um, get out solution for the entire situation. And epidemiological studies come in here in terms of designing methods to sample and resample people who have had proven um, COVID-19 infection or severe disease and to look in the long run about whether they pick up infection again and whether that's linked to different immunological correlates, um, so immunological markers of protection that they showed after their first episode of disease, and whether any severe disease actually promotes a suitable immunological response. 
And then finally, obviously, many trialists at the moment are working on randomized trials to look at different treatments for, um, for COVID-19 severe disease. And the big question um, linked to that is sort of whether we can make severe disease far less bad by just finding a good treatment. And observational data also comes into play here in terms of whether we can see, say, in a primary care data set, indicators that people who are taking um, a particular medication for some other condition are actually less susceptible to infection and less susceptible to disease, because that flags up potential treatments that might actually work against severe COVID-19 in the hospital setting. So lots of um, uses for routinely collected primary care data there in terms of guiding clinical trials. So I'd say that infectious disease epidemiology can't answer all the key questions in the pandemic. And obviously, um, politicians and policymakers are reaching out to people of all sorts of different professions. So that includes behavioural science, economists and health economists, mathematical modellers, policy experts. I mean, the list just goes on forever. And obviously, we're all hugely, hugely dependent at the moment on uh, frontline staff doing an amazing job in healthcare services and in a huge number of other settings just to keep the country going. But I would say that um, I'm hugely proud of all my infectious disease epidemiology colleagues who are currently providing critical expertise in terms of data collection and critically how to interpret the data that we are collecting. So each and every time what exactly different data points mean um, in terms of how we should be making decisions about controlling the pandemic going forwards. Um, so the picture on the left is actually Stevie Nicks, if you recognise her from Fleetwood Mac, who was a gigantic rock star in her own right. And, uh, and if uh, epidemiologists are going to be called rock stars in the future, then I'm, I'm happy for us all to be conflated with Stevie Nicks. I think that'd be wonderful. Um, but just to say that epidemiologists, you know, we recognise that the data we use is never clean. It's never simple to interpret. So we have a mantra of dirty hands and clean mind. And for everything right now and dealing with this pandemic, it's about collecting everything that you can information wise and then interpreting it as well as possible in order to make rapid decisions to help people. And it's um, really amazing seeing so many people hands on doing that work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, for this uh, very nice uh, introduction to the to the topic, uh, I got a first question from uh, Bill too. Um, I think considering the, you can probably try to log in if you want and ask your question yourself, and I can also read it. Uh, depends if uh, if you can uh, can Bill to switch on the microphone and ask the question, or shall I ask it myself? Okay, so uh, the question uh, was whether Corona is an engineered or a coeval virus. Uh, can you uh, comment on this, Helen? Is this uh, a question surrounding whether it arose naturally in the environment? Yeah, well, I, I guess, uh, yeah, whether whether there is any trace in the virus, either sequence or something like that, that it's it's been made by humans. Or whether it has naturally no, evolved from no, other types of no indication whatsoever that this is human made. And one of the functionalities of sort of being a human on this planet is the fact that we expect novel viruses to arise all the time out of the environment. That's just the way that viruses evolve and develop. So unfortunately, it was only ever a matter of time when we saw another natural pandemic, and that's what we're living through at the moment. Are there more questions? I do have one about the children, actually. Oh. Uh, um, so it's 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 relative. Well, it's clearer and clearer that the children seems to be uh, seem to be less uh, prone to spread the infection and get the infection as well. Uh, is is it clear whether this is due to the fact that they are most of the time they've been vaccinated for a, a lower amount of time than we have been or we are, uh, or is that do you think it's something else? Um, so I'd say it's something else, given that we don't have um, a coronavirus vaccine for for anything, really. So the likelihood of, say, an influenza vaccine providing um, 
some sort of alteration to the immune system in older individuals that means we react differently than somebody who's very, very young seems low. Whether it's to do with sort of all the other pathogens that older individuals have been exposed to um, over time, just from season to season, and how we've developed immunity to those um, or an immunological response to those versus how the small children have, I don't really know. And I think it is an absolutely fasc fascinating question. Hmm. Are there more questions for now? We'll have a, a general Q&A so we can ask a couple of urgent questions and then we'll, we'll go to our second speaker. I see Genova Mati. Uh, could you tell us, so I read a question, uh, could you tell us what are at the moment in principle credible hypotheses about the origin of the virus? Um, so so that is, it. it is interesting. Um, the data to date have kind of explored two different avenues and one is whether bats were an originator um, animal population and one is whether pangolins were an originator animal population. To the best of my knowledge, the data is more in favor of bats than pangolins right now, um, but it definitely sort of merits further exploration. And the data to date have been more to do with similarity of sequences across different um, animal and human populations rather than a definite sort of, yes, we can find the bat in a particular location that started this entire process off. Thank you. Good. I think if there are, is no more urgent question uh, for now, we can uh, close uh, that first talk. Thanks a lot, Helen, in the name of uh, everyone present here. Um, I will keep you for uh, the Q&A session uh, in an hour or so. Um, so our second speaker is uh, Judge Lee uh, Roost. Uh, so he... Uh, Pick up my notes. So he's currently uh, associate professor at the University of Zsegyet in Hungary. Uh, he was until recently a research fellow in the UK in Oxford. Uh, so before that, uh, he has had uh, quite a few positions uh, in uh, as a postdoc at the University uh, of York in Toronto, in Canada, and uh, he did his uh, dissertation, his PhD, as I said, as a mathematician. Uh, the University of Shiget uh, also, which he had in 2006. Um, so I think uh, that's enough uh, to uh, to give a, a small overview of our second speaker. Jezli, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, having me in this, in this symposium. So I'm going to talk about some issues related to the mathematical modeling of COVID-19 outbreaks and also what we have done, what we are planning to do in Hungary about this. So let me start with this. It seems like uh, ages ago, but it was just a few weeks ago, as we have seen from Helen's timeline, that we were worried about case importations from China. So these are two uh, Two pictures from February the 4th and February the 5th, all were concerning about people traveling from China to other countries and uh, carrying the disease. So then we, you could see we had just a few cases in Europe, a few in Germany, France, one in Spain. So it was February the 5th, and at, at, on the same day, we submitted this paper. So we did some, some modeling about the global spread of coronavirus. And on the same day when these figures were published, we also submitted this paper. And at that time, we couldn't foresee it's going to be such, such a big thing in such a scale in just a few weeks, even though we were modeling it. So I tell you briefly what this paper was about. So basically, In China, it was a kind of traditional compartmental transmission model when we also incorporated control measures, time varying control measures of the Chinese authorities. And we tried to estimate that cumulative case numbers as potential travelers who can 
travel to other countries and, and bring the virus with them to other countries. So this output from the transmission model in China was fed in into a global mobility uh, network, which is based on travel volume data. And this way we, we quantify the connectivity of different countries with China and uh, basically we estimated the number of travelers arriving to specific target countries and we estimated the probability of outbreaks in the target country by these travelers and it all boiled down to three compound parameters basically the this pool infectious pool in china and uh, connectivity with the country between China and the local parameters in the target country for the potential of spreading of the disease there. And I lost connection. Okay. We can still hear you, I think. Really? Yes, I'm here. Okay. okay. I just okay. lost my connection for a second. <sighs> yeah, so uh, we we fitted the model, model a little bit to the data from China to estimate the cumulative case numbers for different scenarios when control, full control of the outbreak is achieved in China. And then using travel volume data, we could make these risk plots. So, uh, for example, you could see what is the risk of a major outbreak in different countries in, in the top figure like US, Canada, uh, depending on how big the epidemic will eventually be in China. It was ongoing at that time. So also we, you could see in this plot, for example, uh, how strong effort you need to prevent importations from China in Asian countries like Thailand on, or Korea to reduce the risk of an outbreak. So we also uh, estimated this risk for European countries. And you could see there were high risk countries was UK, Germany, Italy, and France. And there were medium risk countries. We selected a few, Hungary included, and we had low risk countries in Europe. So this is risk of a major outbreak due to importation of a case from China. Of course, after the outbreak in Italy and other places, this was not the concern anymore. But back at the time, it was the major concern. So, and there were very many other similar studies actually, and many of them, not just ours, pinpointed to Italy as, as one of the high risk places in Europe for a potential outbreak. So, so using, using these mathematical models, we could provide some insights which are not clear intuitively. For example, if you have uh, two parameters, one is how effectively you prevent the importation from China, and the other is how effectively you can control the disease once, once you, it's in your country. Depending on those parameters, which is the best strategy if you want to reduce the risk of a major outbreak? So. Roughly speaking, you have to enhance your strengths or compensate for your weakness. So if you are like in a football player, you are very good in technique, but, but very poor in physically, you should improve your physical abilities or you should enhance even more your technical abilities to become a better player. It's not so clear. And what we have found here is that you should enhance your strengths as a first step if you want to lower the risk of an outbreak. So basically, in this, we could produce these risk maps, and you should move along the gradients of the risk map to, to reduce the risk the most. Okay, so then we, we had this paper, and then a few weeks later, uh, I was contacted by a journalist from New Scientist magazine, and he, she asked me if I could, could use this kind of model to say something about the situation in Iran, because then only 28 cases were reported from Iran, but there were uh, cases identified in other countries who were just arriving from Iran, one in Canada and one in Lebanon at that time. So I just 
did a very, very basic calculation, a maximum likelihood estimation based on travel data. <clears throat> and I said it was a quite bold statement at the time because it was only based only on two observations. But I said there should be around 2,000 cases in Iran when 28 was reported. So in a few days later, it turned out that this was really the, indeed the case. And uh, importations from Iran were appearing in many other countries. And it was clear in a few days that there were thousands of cases indeed. So and then came two weeks later, March 4th, uh, the first case in Hungary was actually a student who returned from Iran. And then in the following days, they discovered a cluster of uh, infected students, of Iranian students. So these were the first cases in Hungary. And of course, it was a great news at the time, the first COVID cases in Hungary. So then media found out that I, I said two weeks ago, there must be thousands of cases in Iran. So then media picked this up. So then came the, what Helen also mentioned, the rock star status immediately. And I became the mathematician who can predict the, the future. So there were literally uh, lineups, uh, queues in front of my office of journalists waiting to get to talk to me about this Iran thing. So it appeared in many television, radio, newspapers that mathematical models showed Iran as a hotspot before. So, <clears throat> so how you try to model an epidemic with compartmental models? I talked just very briefly about this. I think Marco will tell you more about that in the next talk. So probably many of you are familiar with the SIR model when you have three compartments of the population, susceptibles, infected, and recovered. So it turns out quickly that it's too simplistic for coronavirus because there is incubation period, for example. Uh, <clears throat> so you include, it's not negligible. So you include incubation period in your model and it becomes an SEIR model. And then research, recent research showed that you can be actually infectious one, two days before the onset of symptoms, so during your incubation period. So you have to split up your incubation period into two periods. In the first one, you are <clears throat> infected, but not showing symptoms that, and not infectious. In the second period, you're still not showing symptoms, but you are infectious. And then, of course, we are very much concerned about uh, ICU and hospital capacity. So if you have to break down your infected compartments into those who are hospitalized and those who are in critical care. And of course, there are asymptomatic or mild cases. So the model becomes very complex very quickly. And then you realize that, which was also mentioned in the previous talk, that there are not so many cases observed among children. And there is very large risk of severity and mortality at all ages. So you have to make age groups. You have to separate in your model children and elderly and other age groups. So you make age groups. Of course, you multiply the number of these compartments uh, depending on how many how many brackets of ages you consider. So actually, and this model we used for a short period, but then we changed to other model. We didn't like this one. Uh, so this is an old model which we don't use anymore, just showing it for the sake of example. And if you have such a compartmental model, you can write pretty standard stuff, how you write your equations for uh, transitions between the compartments. And if you have age groups, you have this index I corresponding to age groups. We had seven age groups. So you have very quickly, you end up with a large number of equations with many, many parameters. So. And then you also want to incorporate space because not your country is not necessarily just one single patch when everybody can meet everybody else with the same chance. So you stratify not just by age, but also by space. And if you just consider three cities, for example, and three age groups for young, adult and elderly, then already you have, you multiplied your model basically by, by nine. So, and then you can consider if you have data for mobility, the movement between two different cities, you have these three age groups within one city. And for example, one infected person in the adult age group can infect susceptible children or susceptible adults or susceptible elderly people. And you all need to know 
how these contacts between age groups are structured. So, <clears throat> so to estimate this, we started a, an online survey. It's called MASK. Basically, it's a questionnaire. Uh, this is the, the website. If you speak Hungarian, you can go there and, and fill it and answer the questions yourself. We're asking several questions about where have you been in the past uh, day and how many contacts you had with different age groups. And we can see, for example, after the national lockdown, how the mobility pattern dramatically changed in our survey, according to our survey. So, so many travels before, very few travels after. And the survey has been filled up by many, many people from all across the country, basically from every, every town and every location we have people who filled out the survey, we had more than 300,000 times survey being filled. You can fill it up uh, in different days because we're also interested in the dynamic trends, how the contacts in the society are changing in time. So we measured first how the contacts changed right after the lockdown compared to normal times and after it was sustained this change or not. So in the next slide, I show you how this contact Structure so you can see figures here. The intensity of the colors correspond to the number of contacts between different age groups. You can see that it dropped differently. This is before lockdown, this is after lockdown. And we have separately from Budapest for the cities and for smaller, uh, smaller villages and towns. So, because of course it's an online questionnaire, so it's very self selective and biased. So to calibrate it, we also complemented this questionnaire, online questionnaire with traditional polling on representative samples and, and in, incorporated other data. But even the, the polling results showed there was 90% reduction in contacts in Budapest after lockdown. And in smaller towns, there were much smaller, but still very significant reduction in social contacts. So once we have this uh, contact structure be between age groups, it's also you, you can take a little from this contact matrix from literature, and you can separate your contacts into categories. For example, contacts at home, contacts at school, at work, and other contacts. And then you can have an idea how this reproduction number, so the reproduction number is the average number of infections generated by a single infected individual. This, this R number basically describing uh, the, the spreading potential of the disease. <clears throat> so how this reproduction number changes if you apply different control measures that affects the contacts in the society. For example, if you assume that your of course, it's an average. So if you have age groups, you need some mathematical techniques, how you can average across age groups. So this R is an average reproduction number. And uh, if you assume that in normal circumstances, it's 2.2, for example, you can reduce it to 0 0.8 by closing, uh, sorry, this is Hungarian, but closing the schools plus reducing other contacts outside the household by 80% which is pretty much what happened in, in Hungary. And then you can see if you only close the schools, but you don't change the other contacts, how much reduction you get in your reproduction number. Or if you close down the schools and you apply more moderate reduction in contacts, then you get this 1.3. So this, this is, I think, very useful. It can give you an idea of the effects of uh, uh, your control measures. So, okay, we had this model with many parameters. So this is my, my board from the office, my whiteboard and blackboard, and we try to parameterize the model. As you can see, you have many, many parameters and several of them has very high uncertainty. So it's not so, uh, it's one of the big challenges, how you can parameterize a complex model. Or do you need a complex model at all? So if you look at, for example, the situation now in Hungary, this is the, our epidemic curve. So this is the number of reported cases per day, how it evolves. Uh, you can see it's, uh, first of all, the case numbers are very low. 
So these compartmental models I was talking about, they usually they work when you have a more significant number of infections already in the population. So with small case numbers, the stochastic effects are so large. So this model is not, uh, not very useful at this stage. And even though if you can see there is this wide randomness in the number of reported cases, one day there were like 14 cases reported, a few days later, 210, and again, a few days later, just 50. So this is not the situation what we can, we can use our models at the moment. And also these vertical lines are major events in Hungary when universities were closed, when all primary secondary schools were closed, when uh, a general curfew was uh, applied. And then this is a particular date when we identify the number of, large number of infections in elderly care homes. So we could also, by statistical methods, try to make a real-time estimation of this reproduction number, how it evolved in Hungary. And this, this is what you can see, it came down one in a few weeks and in the elderly care, care home cases brought it up but it came down around one again so of course you you should if you want to avoid the number of the increase in your case numbers you should keep it around one okay so so things some things we are currently developing is one is a a kind of real-time epidemic forecasting system when we have uh, connected mathematical models for each uh, each region in the country and we try to integrate this with various data sources including hospital capacities and, and this is surveillance system so we try to make an early warning system for the future when some region uh, a warning system when some region is expected to reach its capacity in the coming days so they the decision makers can make an action depending on this another kind of model we will be developing a group is developing is a agent based modeling so this is very different from compartmental models so this comes from the level of individuals so we have agents in case of Hungary, nine should have 9.8 million agents who are moving around between different locations according to rules, like can be household, workplace, school, or other locations. And we have a very good resolution, demographic resolution of the country by 100 times 100 meters size of cells. And so we started to develop uh, this group at Pazman University started to develop this tool, modeling tool. Other countries already have such agent-based models on a population, on a country scale. One example is Austria, another example is Australia when they have such models and probably many other countries have also. And so the advantage of this is it allows to uh, estimate the effect or impact of very micro level simulations. Like if you just implement uh, some policy in a given city, for example, or just at given institutions, how it will affect the disease dynamics around. So we had uh, <clears throat> four weeks ago, uh, we set up this modeling response team uh, by the government and it's coordinated and overseen by different members of the government. And actually our project has several branches. One is MAT modeling. We also have a surveillance team of epidemiologists. We also have a data team who are extracting uh, data from different sources and trying to, to integrate all this knowledge uh, in this project. And actually, Several other research groups have been uh, started in, in the past weeks. Virologists in virology, in medicine, and in other, other branches. So ours is just one of those. So I go back to a little bit to this rock star thing. So <laughs> as Helen mentioned, so since our group is also directly advising the prime minister occasionally, 
And these are two pictures from Hungarian media when I'm, this is me and this is a prime minister and here, me talking to the prime minister. So since I've been seen in this situation now, it's, uh, it's, it's not just, it, it's not a rock star thing anymore. So it's also in the political sphere. So I, my name is appearing at many media outlets and actually universities press department prepared this list of media reports, which is 11 pages long, hundreds of items when some activity related to me was reported. And actually, uh, it is, it is widely, widely publicized now that the government is working with virologists and mathematicians. So now any number is coming up in the public discourse. Everybody thinks, oh, this is a number. So this must come from a mathematician. So all these numbers floating around are attributed to me, but very often it, it, I'm not the one where these numbers are originated from. So it's actually pretty annoying that they think everything which is a number, it must come from mathematician who is me. So, and even it has some other, other funny consequences by journalists, journalists coming to me all the time. And even I got strange phone calls from strange people it's not very stable mental state, so I actually I had to unplug my office phone. <clears throat> it's not to be bothered by these people, so it's a it's a very strange situation. But I guess it's in, in similar in many countries when this this coronavirus response is so political, also in the UK and the US, and I guess in many other countries that scientists sometimes find themselves in the middle of this. So I, I try to stay away from politics of course and focus on, on the mathematics which i can do uh, so finally i'd like to make some some reflections on this title um, i gave the title of the presentation that the modeling of coronavirus is impossible but essential so why did i i say that so many challenges have been mentioned before with the parameters unknown parameters with the data with the uncertainties there is one other major problem from, from the modeling point of view. So this is really a historically unprecedented situation. Such a disruption in our societal contacts, I think, has never, never happened before. So basically, especially compartmental models, they're based on a, an assumption of random mixing. So I just get on the bus, sit next to some random person, I can pass on the disease. I go to a restaurant uh, or I, I meet someone with another places. So of course I have my bas basic network of my family, my friends, my coworkers. But in a, in a normal situation, in normal life, I met, I meet with many other people just randomly. So now with with this drastic reduction in social contacts, this random mixing element is basically gone, or it become became very weak. So if you look at the epidemic curves in, in not just in Hungary, in many other countries. It's really strange, and in Hungary, for in Hungary, mostly a significant part of the new infections or new cases, reported cases, coming from small outbreaks at hospitals or elderly care homes. And if I remove that from the epidemic curve, just a very small number of cases remains. So actually, the disease is spreading in a in a very different societal structure when it, it usually does. So. Uh, our usual models are not very good at the moment. So, but even though uh, mathematical modeling is very essential, I think, for a number of reasons. One is that normally we don't have any intuition about the pandemic of this scale. So it's, it's very difficult to contemplate what the, what the pandemic means. We have, we have never seen it such a, on such a scale. So H1N1 was much, a smaller deal than this one. And also it's a nonlinear process. So if I make very small changes in a parameter, even in the reproduction number, between 1.3 and 1.2, can make huge difference on, on long term, or when will you reach your healthcare system capacity or how large the peak will be. So it's also very difficult to see that if I just make very small changes in normal everyday life, that can have huge consequences about how the disease uh, dynamics will really evolve. And even for decision makers, it was very difficult to see 
the scale and the magnitude of these problems before they have seen it modeled. That's my experience. So I just put here just a few graphs. Uh, for example, if you, <clears throat> again, there are some Hungarian uh, words, sorry about that, but so this is now two hypothetical capacities of your ICU, you, a number of ICU beds in your country. So then we can calculate back for, uh, say, your reproduction number 2.2, .2, what, oh, uh, if and if your control measure, your only control measure is without reducing contacts in the society, then what percentage of reduction you need so that your epidemic curve will remain below the peak? So you can calculate that and you can say, okay, we must achieve, say, 40% contact reduction for a period of six, seven months. It's nearly, it's impossible to do that, but assume that you can do that. Then you will never reach your healthcare system's capacity. But then, the epidemics is so suppressed that you will never reach the herd immunity threshold. So this is herd immunity threshold. In either of these scenarios, the cumulative number of infections and then cumulative number of people immunized by going through the disease will not reach herd immunity threshold. So another issue is seasonality. And we don't know how strong seasonal effects this coronavirus will have. But here are a few examples when different, compared different strengths of seasonal effects will give you very different epidemic curves. So either of these things, it's a post lockdown. So we, I assume that lockdown will end soon and, and you will run with the reproduction number 1.3 after lockdown. Then you can see depending on the strengths of seasonal effects, very different, uh, very different pictures you can see very different evolution of the disease in the future. So at the moment, we cannot predict this. So, uh, but people, the politicians and everybody must be aware that any of this can happen depending on how we can manage the reproduction number after lockdown and how strong the seasonal effects are. So if the disease will be very suppressed during the summer, we can expect larger waves in the fall. Yes, so basically, this is what I would, uh, this is what I wanted to, to share with you. And now the debate is in everywhere in Europe is when can we relax these measures on social distancing? And I think this figure is very, very well representing the situation now. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Lee. Indeed, the last image is uh, is very uh, interesting. Uh, I think it's a good, a very good conclusion. It was very fascinating uh, to see uh, applied mathematics at the level of a of a country. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, are there questions urgent right now in the crowd? Maybe I will start with, uh, I, I do have, uh, I'm quite, uh, well, I, I understand as a scientist that uh, the more age groups and the more cities and different boxes you introduce in the model, the more powerful the model in principle is, but of course you have to fill in all these parameters. So that's really the, the major difficulty uh, of this kind of modeling. Uh, so I was uh, wondering, so here you said you were relying on, on, on survey so you ask people uh, how many travel did you do the last months etc um are, are there other ways to get that i mean would there be any ways to to get uh, i don't know uh, from from cell phone stuff uh, how well, how people are moving along are there data sets that you can buy from different public institutions or the hospitals or or uh, yeah cell phones or cars or whatever uh, that you would be able to buy or to get access to to refine these parameters. Yeah, so we have. Yeah, I, I briefly mentioned we have other data sources as well. So we 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 receive aggregated mobility data from cell phone companies. So we could we could measure very well how the general uh, the amount of movements between cities how it changed. We have a very good picture of that. Uh, we have some other sources of data. For example, in, in Seged, in our city, we have a project uh, when they are 
kind of uh, traffic surveillance system. So they can even count the number of people crossing a bridge on a given day and things like that. Yeah. So we, we even have such, on a, on a city level, we also we have such kind of data on how the movements within the city change. It also dropped dramatically. Uh, and what's the limit? I mean, so imagine you, you get the data from Google over one week. So you get all the displacements from everyone uh, within a week. So what, what, what is the limit? Because you've done some, some number of boxes, uh, both spatially and, and in terms yeah, of... Yeah, so, so, okay. You, so yeah, you, have to, you have to make a trade-off. So if you look at this, like this plot I showed at the end, okay, on a country level plot, actually, if you use simpler model, simpler SEIR model, you don't get very different curves, slightly different. So we, we added a large number of complexity and compartments and get slightly better, I, I guess, slightly better uh, or slightly more realistic curves. So is it worth the, the price we pay with the number of increasing parameters and so on? So it depends on what is the actual goal of your model. So if you just want to give a broad picture of possible things that could happen, then simpler models fine. If you want to estimate the impact of a given policy, like school closures, can be open to schools, then of course you need the age groups. Yeah. Or if you want to, wanna, there was, if you want to, implement policies depending on the region of the country, like restricting movements between regions, uh, then you have to consider regions. So I think you always, depending on the question you want to answer, you have to tailor your the level of complexity of your model to that. Yeah. Thank you. There's a question from uh, Damiano Passetto. Uh, he's asking if the spatial model with age classes is already published, a very practical question. <laughs> yeah, I uh, know, not yet. But we are we are preparing a detailed report. Okay. Uh, which we will put online, so we, we hope we will, we can finish it within a week. Within a week, okay. Yes, that, uh, that sounds great. <laughs> so the time is uh, accelerating quite amazingly. Um, are there any other questions in the next minute or so? Um, I don't see anything on my on my side, Thomas. Uh, let me know if I'm wrong. Uh, I propose uh, uh, we go to uh, the third speaker. So, Jezli, thanks again for this uh, wonderful talk, and uh, also please stay online yeah, until the Q and A. Uh, so, our next speaker is uh, Marco Paggi. Uh, he's Italian, uh, one of the the most uh, struck uh, countries in Europe uh, by the virus. Uh, he's full professor since uh, 2017 in structural mechanics at the INT School for Advanced Studies Luca in Italy. Um, so he made his uh, PhD uh, in structural engineering in 2005 at the Politecnico di Torino. Uh, then a postdoc over there. Uh, he has spent also uh, some time as an Alexander von Humboldt fellow an Institute of Continuum Mechanics at the Leibniz University event of Hanover in Germany. Um, so that's the uh, the context. Uh, Marco, if you are online, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. It's my great pleasure and honor to be here and try to uh, convey you uh, the point of view of an engineer uh, working on modeling and simulation in general of physical problems. A physical phenomena. So we'll, I'm, uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, about simulation of COVID-19 epidemic evolution. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, try to answer the question, or in the case we discuss about comportmental models, they could be really predictive. Uh, just a few words about forecasts uh, uh, on COVID-19 epidemic in Italy. Uh, these are just two of the many you may see uh, in newspapers or in general in uh, also in uh, scientific journals. I would like to mention the first one that was published in uh, Lancet, uh, so an international journal uh, with peer review. Here they uh, were uh, making a kind of forecast based on analogy between Italy and the Hubei region in China. So you see here the observations were just dots in terms of number of infected patients uh, versus time, and then predictions. 
Uh, of course, if you mix as a kind of analogy, this could work only for short term. In fact, uh, we have to say that, uh, uh, I will mention this in detail later, we had very different lockdown measures, different severity, different intensity. And so basically, uh, comparing Italy and Dubai, just because they had a similar size in terms of population, uh, would be extremely misleading and, well, uh, quite challenging, I would say. So um, there is another interesting uh, uh, scenario that was actually put in a draft of a technical report of the Italian government, basically the 18th of March, when they started actually just a few days before the, the Italian lockdown. Uh, they were putting basically the daily infections versus time uh, in this draft uh, report. Then finally they removed this uh, uh, plot in the, the day after, in the final version of the technical report, uh, just because I think this is a good indication of a big uncertainty about the future. And you see actually that people later on, almost one, late, uh, one month later, try to compare that uh, scenario uh, reported in that technical report, basically in yellow, you see here the curve, and the real observations. And clearly, uh, you see that uh, uh, the, the forecast was underestimating the, the, real, uh, the real scenario, uh, the, the real observations. So uh, that's indeed uh, much, uh, I mean, very much difficult to make a prediction. And um, I would like to also to say that there are many open issues. First of all, should we use data-driven approach, basically based on an interpolation of the existing data, and then extrapolate, which is often seen in newspapers and all around, or use epidemiological models like CIR, uh, like those we have seen before. I'm in favor of the second one, but let's see that it's not that, that easy. Third, uh, there is a large number of uh, asymptomatic patients, which is difficult to be quantified. So uh, there is an evidence of many asymptomatic patients, but it's not that simple to, to quantify such, uh, uh, such cases. And they are indeed important in the epidemiological models. Uh, then how to identify in general CIR model parameters? Uh, we saw before uh, that it's not that easy. You can enrich the complexity of the model. Uh, the model becomes closer to the reality, but then uh, there's a big issue about uh, parameter uh, identification. And then how to assess also the reliability of model forecasts? You can make many forecasts, and many we saw actually in newspapers or also by scientists, but how to assess their reliability? And then how to exploit also CIR models to support uh, healthcare policies. So I'll try to make an example also about that. So um, I, I'll start with a simplified CIR epidemiological model that was published by Gaeta uh, just on archive uh, almost one month ago. It was related to the Italian, uh, somehow Italian case, Italian system, um, considering a large amount of uh, asymptomatic cases. Uh, it's relatively simple, simplified, as I said. Um, I added just to that model also the, uh, the compartment of dead individuals. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's manageable, as we will see later. So let's start with S. S is the number of susceptible individuals, so is the, the first compartment. Then from this one, let's assume, uh, and this is a simplification indeed, that you may have infected people, I, in this compartment, or the asymptomatic infected people. So people that are infected, but without symptoms. Then after this, what you can have, uh, of course, infected people can recover, and then you have the green uh, compartment, or they could die. So you have uh, the, the compartment of dead individuals. Similarly, the uh, A, so the asymptomatic uh, individuals, uh, asymptomatic patients can become uh, unregistered recovery. So they recover, but they are not registered by the system. Uh, the total population N is constant, is the total population size. Let's uh, suppose to apply this at the regional level. Uh, in general. Uh, here on the left, you see all the ordinary differential equations that govern this kind of uh, epidemic uh, uh, behavior. And uh, uh, let me say, the, the very interesting part is that although it's a simplified model, you have already uh, five parameters. So five model parameters uh, to, to have uh, to make any prediction. So you need to identify them. It's not that easy. Why? Well, because clearly what we really observe 
are just numbers, maybe also not fully, uh, fully correct, and they also need to be carefully uh, checked in, about their validity. But in any case, supposing they are right, then we, we can have data uh, on a daily basis about the infected people with symptoms, uh, recovered people, and dead individuals. So all the rest there uh, is necessary to, 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 to model uh, the evolution of the epidemic. But however, we don't measure, uh, or we have uh, really coarse estimation of those, uh, of those data. So indeed, it's a, it's a big challenge. So I proposed actually uh, to, to use machine learning for the identification issue, in particular uh, applied particle swarm optimization. Uh, particle swarm optimization is extremely uh, powerful um, because uh, uh, basically uh, you, you can really um, uh, you can really simulate uh, you, you can identify basically the, the, the best solution uh, without knowing basically the derivative of the, uh, of the equation. So it's not based on the gradient of the, uh, of the equations. Uh, in general, what you do is to start with a set of particles. A particle here uh, has five coordinates, the five parameters of the uh, serial model. Then what you do is a loop over particles. Uh, those particles can be 50 or something like that. Usually, um, you don't need so many particles, actually. Uh, they are randomly uh, distributed in a uniform way. Uh, then you obtain particle velocity and position. We say something about this. Then you solve the SEER model. You compute a measure of the mismatch, basically the error between your prediction and the real observations. Predictions can be I, R, uh, and D uh, individuals in the compartments. And then in this way, you can introduce a norm to compute such a mismatch, the error as compared to the observed cases. Then you update the particle's best known position if uh, the error is less than uh, basically the previous one. Uh, so you have an history variable, basically. And you can also update the swarm's best known position, so the best collective behavior, if, again, uh, this norm, uh, this mismatch, is less than uh, the previous one. Uh, and then you, you keep going in this way. So basically, in this semi-heuristic uh, approach, uh, you continue updating the velocity of your particles and their position by moving them and uh, trying to find the minimum of uh, the, the, the function f, the global minimum. And you have such a two uh, indicators, the best uh, known position for a given particle in the history and the best position uh, of, uh, of the whole uh, swarm. When you, finally you have convergence, you identify the parameters. Let me show you uh, how it works, basically. In, uh, basically, uh, in reality, we have five parameters, so it would be impossible to plot everything and to show you in, in the diagram. Uh, let's suppose to make a cross-section, just to have uh, two parameters in, uh, in the visualization. There are also the other three computed at the same time. So let's suppose mu and gamma. Uh, the vertical axis here would be uh, the function f, so the error, basically, that you would like to minimize. At the beginning, you have a set of particles. Each dot is a particle, and they are randomly generated. Then let's see the, how the particles' trajectories and positions change uh, the, by increasing the number of iterations of the algorithm in here and here. So uh, usually in a relatively uh, small amount of iterations, it could be 1,000 or so, uh, all your particles converge to the global minimum. And finally, from this global minimum, you can uh, identify the best parameters. So you can apply this approach actually to any SEER model. Uh, I've done uh, basically using the simplified uh, SEER model uh, before, but you can test other models even with more parameters in principle using the same uh, framework. And, um, okay, so let's focus on some uh, case studies, also not to, to, I mean, to focus on something concrete. Uh, let's uh, focus in particular to the Italian case. I would like just to say something about uh, the fact that we had the first outbreak in Lombardia, the 13th of February. Uh, we have open data available on a daily basis from the 24th of February. This is the uh, open uh, uh, database. And we had three major lockdown measures. This is essential to, from my point of view, 
So it's a big difference from the um, situation in, uh, in, in Hubei. Uh, we had uh, a first lockdown the 21st of February with 11 municipalities in the province of Lodi, just uh, in Lombardia. Yeah? Uh, there was called the red zone. Then the 8th of March, uh, the red zone was extended to Lombardia, plus 14 other provinces in Italy. And finally, the, from the 10th of March, we had the whole Italy, so the Italian uh, lockdown uh, came, came into play. Uh, you see here the positive cases by age and also the, the mortality uh, partition depending on the age. So as uh, Gagarly said, indeed, uh, we should take this information into account. Uh, this is not included in that uh, simplified SEAL model. So we will get only the coefficients, uh, those uh, uh, parameters, they are kind of effective parameter over the whole uh, range of ages or uh, population. Uh, but let's see, let's see how, how it works in general. Uh, I will focus on six regions uh, as a case study because those are very interesting. Uh, first of all, I would say I will not uh, apply any SEAL model at the national level directly because we had too much uh, disuniformity, homogeneity in the lockdown uh, uh, conditions and many other issues. So it makes sense to apply this at the province level. Uh, we don't have all the data, uh, at least uh, public data. Uh, so we can apply this at least at the regional level. Lombardia is the first case study. Uh, indeed, we had uh, is the most populated region, almost uh, I mean, more than 10 million inhabitants, highly industrialized and also with high mobility. And this also subject was subject to all the three lockdown measures. And hospitalization was the main healthcare strategy uh, in that region. The second region uh, I'm going to focus is Veneto. Uh, in Veneto is also an highly populated region, about, about half uh, the number of inhabitants as compared to Lombardia, highly industrialized and also with high mobility. It was subject only to two lockdown measures over three. And uh, well, we had the third largest number of cases in Italy. Home treatment, in this case, was the preferred uh, healthcare strategy. Then, uh, Emilia Romagna. Emilia Romagna was also uh, a similar size in terms of population. It's also highly industrialized and had the second largest number of cases in Italy. Then, something completely different is the Valle d'Aosta. Valle d'Aosta is the smallest region in Italy, so just uh, 125,000 uh, inhabitants. But we had the largest ratio between number of cases and population size. And finally, two regions for representative somehow of the central part of Italy, uh, Tuscany, a representative of the Italian regions. We had about uh, 6,000 cases. Uh, those data are from the 16th of April, actually. And, uh, um, and Lazio. Lazio is the second most populated region and also representative somehow of the central region. I can show you now the application of that SEER model upon uh, identification of parameters based on the, CIR, on the machine learning approach to all of, of such, uh, such regions. And so you have here simulated versus reported cases. Uh, I is the infected people, number of infected individuals, N is the population size for each uh, region, and these are the number of days. And you see here, basically, with solid line, the model prediction, and with dots, uh, with the same color, the experimental, the observations. So you see that overall, uh, we are able to capture uh, the trends for all the regions, also for uh, uh, the Aosta Valley. Valle d'Aosta had much less cases, but as compared to the size of the population, we had a large density of in in infections. Uh, similarly, you can see here also uh, the number of uh, the density of recovered people and the density of dead people. So overall, we can state that the model parameters can be identified for all the regions, although they are very different. They have also, of course, different uh, lockdown, uh, they had different lockdown uh, measures, um, and uh, overall uh, have also different, uh, uh, I would say, uh, mobility. Uh, and different uh, based also on the uh, real uh, industrial networks and so on. Uh, so basically, parameters are different depending on the region, but uh, uh, you, you can identify them and at least interpret observed data. But this is an interpretation. What usually scientists do 
after having all the data on, on their desk, and then uh, trying to apply uh, the model to interpret the data. It's useful, but let's see if we can do more. Can we really forecast? Forecast means really predicting something that is not, not yet on our desk, and we would like to simulate and see the future. This is a big question. I will show you that the model is continuously catching up with reality. Uh, to make such an exercise, uh, and to explain what I did, I can plot here just, just show one, one plot, but we do for all the uh, compartments. This is the compartment of the infected people uh, versus days. Um, these are the all uh, data available for Lombardia uh, up to the first 50 days of the epidemic. Let's use uh, a subset of the available data for model parameters identification. So basically for, uh, let's say, training of the algorithm using machine learning, I don't use all the 50 days, but only a part of them, let's say 20, 25, and so on and so forth. Then I can make a forecast up to 150 days uh, from the outbreak in, in Lombardia. Then I can increase the data set size, so from 20, 25, 30 days, and so on and so forth, and can repeat uh, the step one and two and update my predictions. I do expect to have reliable forecasts um, when basically the corresponding predictions become really independent of the data set size. So basically, if I add more data, then really my uh, forecasts are stable. Then this is something uh, that makes sense. Let's see if it happens or not. Well, let's use the first 20 days. So I don't look at the gray dots. I don't know them, let's say. Let's suppose I don't know them. And then uh, I use only the first 20 days available. Then the model will, be, will provide the, the blue curve. It did. It's far from the reality uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, it's not a good forecast. It's able to match the data there and minimize the error as compared to the data, but the forecast is not good. 25 days. Okay, you see the model uh, forecast now again is a solid line. So there is a catching up of the, uh, of the peak of the infected. Uh, uh, individuals, again, far from the reality. And then I can show you that if you apply this uh, procedure from the 30th till the 37th day, then we saw very close forecasts. Indeed, here, we were very close, we were expecting people, at least, uh, to, uh, to be close to the peak of infected people, to the actual infected people. And then if you reach such a, pe such a peak, then you see that actually forecasts really do not change too much. But in reality, unfortunately, there was not such a peak. So data are still increasing. And therefore, uh, let me say, forecasts still depend on the new data provided day by day. So I cannot tell you that uh, real um, forecasts uh, can be really reliable at, the, at, the, at this moment. And this is actually a global plot. Yeah, uh, I don't show only the number of infected people, the actual infected people, but also recovered and dead individuals. Uh, based on this procedure, done on a daily basis. So you see, model forecasts are quite spread. The scatter is huge indeed. And um, we can look especially, uh, if you want to look at the reliability, at the results, uh, at the predictions, uh, really at uh, 150 days. So let's say when we expect to have a kind of uh, end of the epidemic. If it is true, then let's look at those uh, and let's plot those data. So the number of dead individuals at the end and number of recovered individuals at the end of the epidemic. I can show you that those numbers are still increasing. So indeed, uh, although we see that we tend to, to reach a plateau in the number of dead individuals, uh, this number is not yet uh, constant. So uh, model predictions are improving, but yet not, uh, they are not, not enough uh, uh, reliable, uh, not enough, uh, let's say, constant over, over time to, to, to be considered really fully reliable. But I think this procedure is uh, uh, interesting uh, to be applied and continuously up up applied and updated uh, on a daily basis. You can also use, however, forecasting to support healthcare policies. Here, I'll try to show you that in any case, you can enhance the SEER model. Uh, I included in uh, I did basically this uh, small step uh, uh, improvement in terms of uh, uh, being able in predicting also the number of individuals requiring uh, the intensive health care. 
And uh, you see here the observations at the moment in Lombardia with dots and model predictions in, in black. The agreement is uh, reasonably good. And you see here uh, the impact that you will have on uh, dead individuals uh, if you change uh, the capacity of the healthcare units uh, in, in your country, in particular in Lombardia. At the beginning, we had uh, only 861 beds uh, for intensive healthcare uh, treatment. And so in that case, we would have had a lot of people that couldn't be uh, treated with intensive care and therefore, this would have affected the mortality. So we would have much more dead individuals, basically the purple curve. A few, basically, days later, there was an improvement, an upgrade of the system with up to 1,067 beds. This was indeed better, you see here. And finally, uh, now we know we have 1,600 beds for the uh, healthcare, uh, healthcare, uh, intensive healthcare. So basically, in this case, uh, you have just the mortality uh, related to the, uh, to the disease and not related to the fact that you have a lack of uh, uh, intensive units. Uh, so indeed, uh, uh, the model could support healthcare policies, at least for the design of hospital capacities, and especially transfer of patients across regions, basically on-demand on transfer. And I will conclude, basically, saying that uh, well, models are still catching up with real observations, so um, worry about any, any, any real uh, prediction at the moment. The, the, the model is, in any case, uh, an approximation of the reality. Uh, in, ex, uh, interpolation and extrapolation uh, is dangerous, but also, in general, uh, the application of those models uh, is not that easy uh, because uh, uh, we, we need to, to find, uh, uh, basically, a situation when, finally, um, predictions become reliable. And we need to judge about the reliability of models, not just taking uh, uh, a model prediction as, uh, as it is. Uh, we need certified data and also a worldwide share of knowledge uh, because we need to implement uh, strategies probably uh, in a more um, coherent way at the uh, worldwide level because there will be, in any case, at a certain point, the end of lockdown, and therefore, people moving uh, from a country to another. So we will need to, to model this basically with the movements and so on, as previous um, uh, speakers said. And we, from the knowledge, however, of the complex dynamics, we can plan strategies to cohabit with COVID-19. So indeed, modeling is useful uh, because, for instance, we saw that uh, it's important to identify asymptomatic patients. They are an important parameter somehow in uh, ingredient in, my, in any serum model. Uh, we need to protect elderly people we so they have a higher mortality. And we also need to design systems with on-demand intensive care units, uh, and this can be done. I think that's, uh, that's a key point in order to avoid uh, further uh, human losses due to the lack of uh, enough uh, intensive units. And well, if you would like to be uh, continuously updated, uh, you can refer uh, on this research, you can refer to, to this technical report and also an updated manuscript on archive uh, where I try to update basically on a daily basis the, the, uh, the new data and the new predictions. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thanks a lot. Uh, very uh, fascinating also talk. Uh, I will uh, start with a couple of questions we have got in, uh, during your talk. I think a uh, question from Damiano Pazzetto, Pazzetto. Sorry if I mispronounced the names. I think it's a question on your talk. Who was that at 5.22? Uh, so the question is, uh, is particle swarm stable with the initial distribution of the particles? And there is a second part. Uh, how are the initial boundaries of the parameters selected? Yeah, very good. It's, uh, both are very relevant. Uh, I could say yes, uh, they are stable. Uh, I can tell you that uh, yeah, the initial conditions are important. Uh, at the beginning, uh, the uh, susceptible are just the population size n. Then uh, the number of infected people uh, to have a stable model must be at least 10, uh, 10 individuals. Uh, basically, uh, for uh, Lombardia, there was no problem. We already had, uh, from the first data set, 166 individuals. Uh, for the other regions, there was a time delay. 
So I was plotting basically the uh, time zero when we had at least 10 individuals. Uh, it's, it's a small number as compared to, 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 to the rest. And then I, I consider just that as a kind of uh, uh, initial number for the um, infected individuals. Uh, in terms of the, the other parameter, uh, the other boundary uh, initial condition is the uh, number of the asymptomatic individuals. But based on this simplified model, then it depends just on C. So it depends on uh, the probability of becoming uh, uh, infected. And therefore, I don't need to spe uh, specify that number as an additional parameter. So that initial condition is basically related to the number of initial infected uh, people, uh, and then multiplied by the ratio, basically uh, a function of C, uh, of the probability of becoming infected. Uh, apart from that, uh, the, the particle zone of optimization was working in a very stable way uh, for all the regions I tested. Um, I was just showing six because I think I wanted to show that we can actually do for very different scenarios. And uh, yeah, so this is somehow my, I try to, yeah, I hope to have applied to, to your question. Good. So, uh, he had, uh, Damiano had a second question, I think, uh, whether you are considering the lockdown during parameter estimation. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, I'm not done, although. It's a, it's a simplification. I do agree that we should take into account the, this, this, uh, this effect. Uh, there are papers in the literature that consider basically in the beta parameter, or so in one model, uh, one model parameter, uh, the, the possibility to have basically time dependent uh, parameters. This could be done. So basically, in my case, it was not. So uh, all the parameters are kind of effective parameters taking into account. Uh, uh, a sequence of different lockdown measures. Um, but of course, if you want to have probably a really short-term, detailed prediction, then the best way would be to consider uh, also uh, a kind of parameter. They are also, let's say, uh, time-dependent. So and then, uh, you, you, however, you will co complicate a lot the, the identification procedure. Although I think that, uh, that, that could be done as well. Thank you. Uh... I have other questions uh, on the on the, the my private chat here, but uh, I think some of them are maybe for the other speakers. I don't know if there is a way that the speakers all switch on the video, then we can see them during the Q and A because we can slowly uh, get into that. So uh, while they are doing this, if you want to ask a question to one of the speakers, there are two ways: either you uh, send your question in a written form uh, to me uh, in the well, you you click on my name and then you say. Go to the private chat and you ask your question there, and I will read it for you. But uh, that would it should also be possible to uh, just uh, switch on your camera and microphone and directly uh, talk to the speaker. Uh, uh, apparently, the server is going fine, so uh, don't hesitate to come into the discussion if you want. Uh, do we have the videos of our speakers? I'm not sure if it's going to to work. Helen, are you around? Yes. I thought Helen. my video was showing, yep. Okay. Uh, Judge Lee, well, I mean, we can do it with the audio as well. Um, I have a question uh, from Ibrahim uh, Mehdi here. Um, I think it's for Helen, but I'm not completely sure. Uh, the question was, uh, how does the virus affect smokers, if at all? And um, so I'd say that we, we don't really know yet, and the question of smoking comes in when we think about the distribution of disease and gender. So that was kind of when it was first flagged as to whether the higher prevalence of severe disease in males was linked to smoking. And there have been some studies that have looked at smoking as an independent risk factor for whether or not you get severe COVID-19, but there's not a huge amount of data out there yet, although there is a lot of interest. So I'd kind of say watch this space over the next month or so. Thank you. Uh, a question from uh, Mathieu Verstreiter uh, to Judge Lee, I think. So Judge Lee, are you around? Yes. Uh, so the question is, given a huge uncertainty, especially for next season, uh, which input is really useful for, for politicians to base their decisions on? 
Is there any absolute risk evaluation? Yeah, so, so the, I think the main message is because of these huge uncertainties, uh, we have enhanced surveillance and very effective tracking and monitoring of how the disease will develop. And we have to keep recalibrating our models as, as time goes on. So, so at the moment, of course, we cannot make any specific predictions. So but we can just show a range of potential futures. But I think it's very important to monitor the situation as closely as possible. I, I cannot really say more. Yeah, there's a, a lot of, uh, well, influence of uh, the science that uh, you guys are doing and, and the, pol the politics. So it's quite complicated indeed. Um, so I don't know if uh, Mathieu is uh, happy with the question. Uh, <laughs> is the answer, sorry. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, Mongela is uh, asking a question or uh, uh, or chair. Um, so it's a question to all speakers. Uh, how do you see uh, this playing out? Uh, how shall I read this? Uh, we will see repeated waves of lockdowns. And uh, what about international travel? So I think the, the question is whether the future, whether there will be yeah several lockdowns, one after each other. Um, and for those who have, I mean, particularly in Europe, for example, because we are here in Europe, uh, um, has there been any study about traveling from one country to the other and which kind of measures influences the spreading of the virus between the different European countries? I don't know if... Uh, who. Why? Yeah. Yeah, so th there were some modeling studies about uh, repeated lockdowns uh, at, and uh, so the, the, the problem is that if your if your only measure is lockdown and you don't use any other other control measure then what you should you can do is that you have very short period of kind of free so society followed by a longer period of lockdown and then a short period without lockdown and a long period of lockdown. If your only countermeasure is the lockdown, then that's what you can do. And it's, it's clearly not, uh, it's not sustainable just simply uh, repeating lockdowns. Uh, so it's, it's very clear you need, you need something else. You need other measures be besides lockdown. Can I maybe chip in there? Sure. Um, so I would completely agree with that. And I think potentially what we're going to see, and I would say I'm not involved in the political um, negotiations that are happening in the UK, but potentially what we'll end up seeing is lockdowns in order to get case numbers below a certain threshold. And, um, you know, the the threshold numbers of what our healthcare services can deal with. So get us below both of those points um, in order to protect our healthcare for the you know next month or so. But then on top of that, once you've got those case numbers down to reasonable levels, then you have to do really, really serious contact tracing. And you can do that because numbers are much smaller at that point. Um, so your public health facility should be able to be resourced well enough. Um, so at that stage, you are making sure that people who have got the disease are actually quarantining effectively and you're picking up the people they've infected very quickly and making sure that they're going into quarantine. So those two measures combined, I could see potentially being very effective, but that doesn't negate the concept that you then want to go into and out of lockdown if case numbers rose to such a level that you're about to overwhelm your healthcare facilities again. And in terms of... Um, sort of open or closed borders and the resumption of international travel, then that will have to be a decision made country by country in terms of how each country is doing itself and then sort of main flight routes that come into it, how well those countries are doing in terms of virus control. Because obviously you don't want to take your case numbers internally down really low only to re-import the infection from a bunch of other places. So I guess it will be a balance. And I think international travel at the levels we were doing 
back in January or so are going to take a long time to resume, to be honest. Okay. Um, thanks for your answers. So I have a question from uh, Gemma uh, Modinos. Um, to all speakers also. Uh, so thanks for your excellent talks. I, I, I read the questions and I, I try not to interpret it. I just read it. Uh, thank you for your excellent talks and for sharing with us your research. Uh, different countries are enforcing different social distancing strategies at the moment. This is generating an ease uh, globally for the general population. As scientists in different countries who are modeling a worldwide pandemics, uh, what are your thoughts about these different strategies? Uh, based on your knowledge and models, what is the optimal strategy in your opinion? Strict lockdowns such as Spain or Italy or virtually very little uh, like in Sweden? Is there like? something about Italy? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, in Italy, I would say we needed um, at a certain point uh, a severe lockdown. Uh, so, the now it's called Italian lockdown um, because uh, uh, we basically uh, had big issues with the number of intensive care units. They were not uh, not enough for uh, supporting, basically, withstanding the, the, the load uh, from from the patients. Uh, so at that point, we needed to, to basically establish this lockdown. Uh, couldn't be done uh, in one shot. Uh, because you know it's not that easy to stop uh, the whole country in one shot, and then uh, um, this, however, was essential to to reduce such a relief, such a such a big load. Now we, we saw also in the previous uh, one of my slides the number of uh, people in requiring uh, intensive uh, healthcare are diminishing, uh, and so I think now uh, it, it's time uh, to to also to to release the the, lock, the lockdown. Uh, because there are other issues like the economic constraints and many other aspects that need to be that to be taken into account. Uh, but at that moment, it was essential. Now, basically, we can learn also from that period. Uh, we can learn how to manage other outbreaks because there could be, uh, of course, there could be uh, also in other in other regions in order to have a system that could be able to withstand other uh, other outbreaks. Thank you. So if, if I may add just one comment. Yeah. So what, what we see uh, in Eastern European countries has much, much lower growth in case numbers than Western European countries. So I think it's a very interesting question. What's the reason for that? So one possible reason is that uh, the lockdowns were implemented at a much earlier phase of the outbreak than in other countries. In Hungary, we just had a handful of cases when schools were closed and university was closed. So I think the question is, is it, is it a sufficient explanation for this phenomena that uh, there are so fewer cases in Eastern Europe than in Western? I think it's a very interesting question. Yeah. Just the timing of the lockdown is a sufficient explanation for yeah, it. was very different. And uh, I know people in Czech Republic who also reported a very, very uh, strong lockdown at a very early stage. Uh, and indeed, they have, they have flesh cases, yeah. Good. I, I actually had a, a question. Uh, you, there, there were a couple of, of slides on the threshold immunity, which has been discussed quite a lot also by politicians. And, and usually these thresholds always seem to be around 60%. And it's, it's a little bit uh, magic to me because I would say, uh, not being an expert in these things, that uh, the, the threshold should be dependent on R0, for example, and on some parameters of the virus or the society in which it's developing. So can one of you explain uh, wh why this uh, immunity threshold seems to be always around 60%? Is there some uh, easy explanation for that? Well, I think it's, it's just a rough number. So. The, the herd immunity threshold is 1 minus 1 over R0. Uh, right. and, it does uh, depend on R0. Yeah. It depends on R0, yes. Okay. Even, even this is a little bit misleading because this, this, assumed, this assumes, again, a homogeneous, that the, the immune people are homogeneously placed in your population. 
So, for example, for UK, if every everyone is uh, immune in England but nobody in Scotland, then maybe you have six, seventy percent or eighty percent. But if you don't have, <laughs> you still will have outbreaks in Scotland. So, I think this this is this herd immunity threshold is a bit misleading in this sense. So. Uh, again, so there was this idea that you, you let the, the young people or the, the low risk people to build up immunity, and this way you can protect the elderly people. But it's not it's not that simple because mm. you need you need this immunity distributed somehow evenly across the population. And just to also say that the herd immunity threshold for measles is actually 90 to 95 and for polio is about 80, so not all conditions that are around 60. Okay, good. So it's only because the zero is always about two that uh, the immunity threshold is always reported. About. Yeah, if it's two point something, then you get... Okay, okay. Um, I don't know if there are more questions. I, uh, I do have a question here. Uh, yes, please unmute your microphone. It's from Ahmed. I don't know where you're from. Maybe you can introduce yourself. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. It's me, uh, Hamid Zari uh, from IMT Luka. And uh, first of all, I, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, thank YAE for organizing this symposium. And uh, I have a general question, uh, especially uh, from related to the Marco presentation. And uh, my question is that, um, um, what do you think, uh, why even in the situation that Italy were locked down completely, the positive cases uh, were uh, increasing uh, drastically? Yeah, it's a good question. Actually, um, uh, let me say, first of all, the number of asymptomatic cases seem to be quite, uh, quite large, at least according to some Italian I mean, reports by uh, Italian doctors and also some preliminary data that are published by the Istituto Superiore della Sanità. So it means that uh, mm, probably it was difficult to track, actually there was no tracking uh, of people, and uh, uh, so the, the number of really infected people was, was, uh, was, was very large. Uh, then uh, actually now uh, we are in a situation where we see uh, a decay in the, uh, in the infected cases. Uh, so uh, surely we will see at a certain point uh, that we will reach the peak of the actual infected people. And therefore then there will be for sure the decay. However, th this uh, comes very, very, very slowly. So, um, uh, well, to be honest, uh, the situation is uh, uh, at the national level uh, is quite critical, but uh, consider that the majority of cases are in Lombardia. And Lombardia, uh, so is a big story itself. Uh, the, for the other regions, the situation is getting better and faster. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, it's not that trivial to, to, to answer your question. That we had not such a basically very fast decay like in uh, uh, in China, uh, in the Hubei region. So uh, indeed, there is something different. Um, maybe at the beginning, people anyway, there was not a strong, uh, uh, let's say, respect also of the uh, red zone. Um, uh, we had also a progressive uh, series of lockdown measures. Um, therefore, the severity. Of that was uh, was changing over time, uh, so maybe we were a bit slow at the beginning also. Um, so yeah, it's it, it's a good question, and uh, we don't have actually a clear answer at the moment. And so we still see that uh, we don't reach the the, the peak of uh, actual uh, infected people, and uh, uh, so this is actually why um, policymakers are making a delay in the uh, end in the finding the end of the lockdown. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks a lot. I think. Oh no, I do have a question here. Uh, question to Professor Paji. Uh, can be useful. Can it be useful to modify the equation considering stochastic noise in the data? Yeah, uh, for sure. Yes. Um, uh, as Gagarly also said, in this case, we had uh, um, 
in Italy, uh, many cases. So when you have few uh, uh, few cases, actually, uh, then uh, the, the random effect uh, has a huge, uh, huge effect. Uh, in, uh, in the Italian case, uh, uh, we had a huge amount of data, a uh, huge amount of infected people, huge amount of dead individuals. Uh, um, so I think the stochastic uh, effect was uh, probably at a global level not so uh, not so huge. However, if you want to model uh, or try to use these uh, um, these uh, these SIR uh, models in general, the best way would be to to start really at the uh, with the kind of bottom up approach. So apply this not at the global level, but really at the micro uh, scale level. So, for instance, at the scale of the province. Um, in the case, uh, there could be scattered from a province to another. There are cases also where we have uh, we had few cases, uh, few individuals. And therefore, in that case, uh, for sure, um, the stochastic and randomness will play a, a major role. Uh, not probably for the... the, the, the Region like uh, Lombardy. Thanks a lot. I do not see. Oh, there is here. Uh, yes, Dario Pidja would like to ask a question for Paji. Uh, please unmute your mic. And maybe present yourself. Dario? Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Uh, can I ask? Yes, sure. Okay. okay. Yes, I have a question for uh, Marco Paggi. Uh, yes. It, uh, it seems, based on, um, on your analysis, that it is quite difficult to predict the evolution uh, of the COVID outbreak uh, just looking at the past. So I was wondering. Uh, for instance, if you can use machine learning, uh, instead of predicting the future, so instead of doing forecast, for instance, to try to find the similarities between among the evolutions of the outbreak uh, in different countries on, or regions. So, for instance, you may realize that uh, the evolution of the outbreak, uh, let me say, I don't know, in California is uh, similar to the evolution of the outbreak in uh, Lombardia. And so since Lombardia came before, uh, for instance, it can be a good indication for California to take uh, um, some corrective measurements. So I was wondering if you can use this type of, uh, or if you thought about using uh, uh, yeah. basically unsupervised learning to, mm -hmm. to try to cluster. Evolution. Yeah, Dario, uh, you, you can do, I think you can do this exercise. Uh, the question is, uh, at least, uh, when we started here actually in uh, Italy, uh, uh, the, the previous case that was quite clear was, uh, was basically China. Ch in China, we already had uh, a decay uh, of the number of infected people. So we were uh, already uh, seeing that the lockdown measure was, uh, was having a role. However, from, from those data, you could see also that, uh, I mean, there is a huge uncertainty also the way data are provided and certified. Uh, there was about the 12th of February, a peak of something like 10,000 10, uh, new infections uh, uh, showing up in the, the, in the data from, uh, from China. So, uh, first of all, uh, there is a big uncertainty about, uh, um, about basically the data, the certification of the data. Second, uh, lockdown measures are in general different. And they do depend also on the mobility, depend also on, on many issues. At the beginning, we had uh, somehow a low uh, lockdown measures. There was a possibility still to go at work for uh, basically uh, for, for, for job reasons and so on. And the mobility uh, network is also completely different from a country to another. Um, this exercise, at least, was used in, in Italy quite a lot to make a kind of analogy between uh, uh, Italy and uh, China, basically just using the repro basic reproduction number and then saying, well, uh, I saw also some uh, prediction based on that. that. They said, well, when we reach the reproduction number equal to a certain amount, we saw that in China uh, this was uh, lasting uh, for uh, uh, five days. And then people were basically 
making such analogy and predicting uh, what could happen if uh, the production number would be the same. Uh, uh, we are the same. However, to be honest, uh, I think it's a big uh, speculation in that case. Uh, it would be extremely risky. In fact, all those uh, uh, predictions were failing and they needed to update the model itself. Um, we can do a better supervised, uh, supervised learning, uh, but we need to, in fact, as I said, to have more share of information across uh, countries because um, you need many details to better understand if you can compare or not uh, a country or a region with another one. Uh, different dynamics, uh, different uh, uh, mobility conditions, different in general also lockdown measures and how they are also observed by, uh, by, by people. Um, so basically, I would say we, we could do that, uh, but then we need, of course, a lot of help from uh, other people that can judge and uh, make comment on uh, the reliability of, of those comparisons and so on. Otherwise, we risk to make just an exercise, and I'm not sure that uh, uh, it could become really uh, better than, than, uh, than what we did. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Dario, for taking the microphone. I think uh, we slowly head towards uh, 6 o'clock. It's actually 6.02. Um, so I would like to uh, close the symposium uh, now, uh, first by thanking our three speakers. I think they gave uh, very complimentary uh, views on the epidemiology of the virus and, and on how, uh, let's say, the science and the politics can be uh, intertwined and are intertwined and maybe more today than three months ago. So that was very uh, fascinating to see. Um, I, I, won't, I, I don't want to leave before thanking uh, Thomas Susi from the University of Vienna uh, for setting up the, the technical facility to have this first uh, YA meeting. Um, I would like to uh, thank uh, everyone of you who have attended uh, the meeting and asked your questions. We had a very lively Q&A answer. Um, we are going to uh, uh, publish uh, the video of this meeting online, probably on YouTube. Uh, I think feel free to ask questions uh, in the YouTube uh, below the video, and maybe our three speakers can can uh, take some time to answer the questions uh, on, on a longer time scale, let's say, uh, than during these two hours. Uh, maybe I would like also to remind everyone uh, to uh, send us uh, your feedback uh, if you if anything went wrong or, or particularly good during these meetings. You can send your feedback to the board uh, of the YAE. I would be very happy to uh, to take it and, and organize uh, the next meetings online uh, better than today. Although I think it did went uh, it, it did go quite well. Um, and also, please realize that if you would like to propose a topic uh, for uh, a next YAE online symposium, uh, you can also send us uh, your uh, proposals and maybe your talk if you would like to talk in this uh, situation. Uh, we'll be happy to have. Uh, uh, people who want to do that. So thanks again to everyone and have a good evening and stay safe at home. Bye-bye. <laughs>